Good morning. Hi, everybody. And I see a uh, sense a lot of energy. That's good. That's very much talkative and happy to be here for the cookies and the speaker, I hope. Uh, good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to another seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Megan Lapere from uh, the USGS and also from the uh, School of Renewable Natural Resources at LSU. Uh, Megan has a dual appointment. She's a, a scientist for a USGS and also a professor for LSU. Uh, she got her PhD uh, in uh, oceanography and uh, coastal sciences, working with uh, Irv Mendelssohn uh, out of LSU. And then she went to the USGS to work with uh, Don Cahoon, and then after that she joined her current position. Uh, Megan has done a lot of work uh, with restoration of uh, natural coastal resources, such as oyster reefs and marshes, and looking at the both theoretical, basic, and applied side of it. And lately, she's been working a lot with uh, the concept of living shorelines, and she'll be putting all that together today during her talk. So thank you for coming. All right, thank you, Juice. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Can everybody hear me? Since we've tested it only 24 times, yes? <laughs> Excellent. Um, so over the, in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, given the recent focus, particularly with all the oil spill settlement and money on restoration and monitoring of our coastal resources, um, and in particular, the development of these large-scale Gulf-wide frameworks for restoration, I thought I would focus entirely on what my lab has been doing related to oysters and the reefs they create. And because I'm talking about sort of the big picture, obviously we didn't do this work in isolation, and I wanted to just acknowledge up front that this type of work only gets done with a lot of great people. I'm not gonna go through these names, but it's all of that what I'm showing you has benefited from inputs from other ecologists, physiologists, and more recently, some would say I've come to see the light in trying to bring my field and lab data to help inform the models that are often used to inform a lot of our management stuff. So we all work with natural environments and we all know this instinctively, but universally there's an enormous amount of variation that we work with when we work in a natural environment. And this varies at spatial scales with processes that operate and impact the environment in the order of millimeters all the way up to the global scale. And this also is true when you think about the temporal scale that you're trying to deal with when you're working in restoration in natural environments. You have deal with processes that operate on the scale of milliseconds to thousands of years to millions of years. And as examples, you can think of uh, bioturbation by infauna, up to dealing with the deltaic cycle if you're working in a delta system, to things like global climate change. And nowhere is this more true than when you work in an estuary. Um, estuaries, generally, if you're working with a resource in an estuary, you know you're working along a gradient, which is also imposed upon this variability in both space and time. When we talk about habitats in estuaries, um, it's sort of estuaries are composed of multiple subhabitat types, but most of those are formed by living organisms. They could be faunal, um, such as oysters, or they could be floral, such as our salt marshes. And so understanding the variability, how it's expressed, and how it impacts your organism and the habitat it creates is extremely important. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna focus on oysters today. Um, not the most charismatic species, we also call it the living rock. The eastern oyster, which is what we have down here, is the dominant reef building organism, and many might argue the only real reef building organism and uh, organism that provides hard bottom habitat, aside from what humans create, in our estuaries. It lives mostly a sedentary life, except for the first couple of weeks. And so understanding once it settles, the conditions it settles in are not likely to be the conditions that it is exposed to during the course of its life history. So understanding how it can respond to these different environmental changes, um, understanding how the individual responds, how it helps in building the reef, and how individual reefs correspond, and how these different reefs or populations are impacted 
over time is extremely important and needs to be understood when you're talking about restoration or developing monitoring plans you need to define the spatial and temporal scale that you're interested in because those will define not only the questions but the answers that you're going to get so we care about oysters and if anyone's ready for lunch because some people like them some people don't but they're extremely important down here culturally and economically represent somewhere kind of varies but over 60% of the US commercial harvest comes from the Gulf Coast and Louisiana where I do most of my work accounts for the most of that but aside from their economic importance we also know that they're ecosystem engineers and they're considered foundation species so a lot of work and when people talk about restoration and monitoring they're either talking about the importance of monitoring or restoration for the economic harvest but they may also be talking about their importance as a foundation species and what they contribute to the habitat qualities through water quality so their filter feeders and they can filter the water and they've also been shown to potentially sequester nutrients um, they've been built in and used for shore protection um, as Juice did mention with living the idea of living shorelines and I know that you have a pretty active program here at the lab and in Alabama because they may alter energy currents and trap sediments and then they've also been shown to provide very valuable habitat not just for themselves but for important uh, economically and commercially important fishery species and ecologically we value it and more recently we're starting to put economic numbers on the value of these services in different environments so if you go back to this graphic of temporal and spatial scales when we start talking about and developing these frameworks to guide our restoration and monitoring um, and don't hold me to where any of these blobs are they could be in a lot of different places it's just trying to make the point that we really need to think about how what we're doing fits into what spatial scale we're looking at and therefore what processes we need to think about and the same and what temporal scale we're going to be looking at so I am going to go through um, a few of these different connections that we've started to make with some of our work and the first is just getting at um, you know it's the oyster no matter what you're doing when you're restoring an oyster reef is you need to understand that you are interested in what the oyster is doing so how the environment affects the individual and how that builds the population or the reef um, is one first important part to consider and we do know that the environment obviously with any organism is critical in how an individual grows and what type of mortality we see with oysters the two factors that have been shown over decades because it is an economically important species are that salinity and temperature control basically every physiological rate um, of the oyster affecting growth mortality as well as their reproduction we also know that salinity and temperature can affect disease so therefore mortality the predation varies with salinities and temperatures and we know that salinity and temperature affect plankton composition in the water so it could affect food availability or quality um, that's available um, this just shows that salinity and temperature act alone but they also act synergistically these two graphs show uh, are taken from our long-term Louisiana wildlife and fisheries data set with about 30 years of data on the growth and mortality of the eastern oyster and it shows you how mortality is impacted um, if you look on the left um, that you have sort of lowest mortality at more of a moderate salinity our oysters in Louisiana tend to live in fresher areas than a lot of people think about um, best growth on the right graph you see is around a salinity of 15 parts per thousand and you can see that if you get to lower temperatures or higher temperatures you may end up um, with different impacts or differing impacts based on salinity so environment is critically important and we know that in your typical estuary that salinity in particular I'm going to focus on because the temperature in our estuaries will vary seasonally but when you're comparing different restoration sites or areas our, our temperatures tend not to have a lot of variation because it's a very shallow water estuary but salinity can vary enormously so within any ideal estuary if you have an oyster in one spot it'll experience a fluctuation in salinity based on how much fresh water inflow you have or based on how much of the saline water from the Gulf is being pushed in 
and this affects everything related to the oyster with growth, recruitment, disease, and predation. And not only do we have the normal estuarine variation, but this can vary on daily cycles. It can vary seasonally, can vary due to storms, and on more large-scale cycles, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And so when we step back, and we know all of this about oysters, this is nothing new, and we go to do restoration, and these are just um, pictures taken from all over the East and Gulf Coast of different types of restoration that people have done in order to build an oyster reef. We know that the key thing is selecting the best location. And the second thing, if you don't have a reef or a historic footprint there, is that you need to have hard substrate. Because we work in mud, um, you need to have something there for the oysters to recruit and settle on. And so when I started in this work, I just went in, worked with some organizations, and thought, OK, you throw the stuff out there. Let's go see what happens. Um, you know, a lot of people had said, when you come down here, you talk to the people that work with economic harvest. They say, we know everything there is to know about oysters. In fact, we have lots of different types of habitat suitability indices, which will tell us where we should put our oyster reefs. This is an example of one that was built um, by a number of organizations, but it was sort of led by the Nature Conservancy. And it's an oyster restoration suitability map. Um, I think it's available for the entire Gulf Coast. And the dark blue are areas that are considered to be high, areas where you're likely to get great restoration, recruitment, and growth of oysters. Starting about 10 years ago, um, the Nature Conservancy and Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries started building reefs. All of their reefs were located in these highly suitable areas. Um, not going to get into details about any one project, but you can see that they're all located in suitable areas, and they're spread across our entire coast into a range of different estuaries um, in Louisiana. And we have multiple years at most of these sites, we're still monitoring some of them, looking at oyster densities. And this is uh, five of the sites over three years, their first three years from construction, um, with oyster density on the y-axis. And you can see that there's absolutely no pattern. I mean, the, the response that we got is all over the place. And so just putting the oysters in these areas identified by these habitat suitability indices or these reef bases it was not, we didn't have enough information. Um, we also wanted to kind of get into it some more to try to understand why we may have some sites, such as the one in pink, Grand Isle, which is where we have our oyster hatchery located because it's an ideal place for oyster growth, um, not increasing in oyster density very quickly, while other sites, like in gray, our Sister Lake site, which is a, a huge one of our big state uh, important production areas, doing extremely well from year one. And so we started looking at population uh, demographics or size class distributions over time. And these are just the means and the, with the, the point of the lines being at the min and max of the size of the oysters that we collected or surveyed at each of the sites. And if you just compare uh, the two on the left, Sister Lake, which is doing really well, you can see that over time the mean size increased some, but not too much because you usually get huge recruit class and there's a high mortality. So you usually have it skewed towards the small ones, but you obviously had oysters surviving over those three years. Um, while in Grand Isle, you would get some recruitment, but we never got anything really big. And so this is where we talked about salinity and temperature can affect growth and mortality, but they also affect other factors that will influence how a reef or a restoration project does. And this graph highlighted in green um, is showing <clears throat> two things. So mussels um, can often outcompete they'll, if they'll settle on some of these reef structures and they'll outcompete our oysters. So those sometimes will limit reef restoration success through competition and understanding more about mussel um, habitats and recruitment is probably important when you're selecting your site. And then, and I didn't make another graph, but if you see at Grand Isle, oyster drills. So at Grand Isle is a higher salinity site, which is why we get some of that great growth. But it's pretty much oysters on a platter for the, as far as the oyster drills are concerned. 
and so we get enormous densities of oyster drills and they were eating all of the recruits before they could grow to adult size. The other thing that we've been working on when looking at kind of trajectories or development of these reefs in different locations is along with Tom Sonia and Eric Powell and those groups have been doing work trying to get at Roger Mann shellfish budgets. So we talk about the individual oyster and it's important to understand how, what controls oyster recruitment and growth, but a reef is built not just by recruitment and growth, but also by the mortality of the oysters and the provision of shell over time. And so using our numbers from the one site that I had in gray, the Sister Lake site, where we got great recruitment and densities, we built a shell budget model. Along the bottom were just our six small experimental reefs. And we calculated how much shell in terms of grams per meter squared was accreting. Because the area that this is located in is particularly important because we have huge subsidence rates. So even though you may be building a reef and putting it there, if you don't get enough oysters, you don't get enough growth, and then you don't get enough mortality in place, your reef's going to sink over time. And so this kind of shows that not only is there variability in areas that are doing really well, we had above the pink a lot of years and locations where shell accretion was likely keeping up with subsidence rates, but you also had a lot of variability between our experimental reefs and between the different years. And so in thinking about the spatial scale when you're monitoring or the temporal scale that you're looking at, you have to understand, you have to be aware of how many, what type of spatial scale and temporal scale you want to, you know, set your monitoring goals or your restoration goals for. And a lot of it, this is just bringing it back to one of our key factors, comes back, you know, understanding individual success and population success and reef success is often tied to the environment. And again, you're going to be sick of it, but salinity is everything for us in our estuaries. And the two dotted lines are what in Louisiana is where we get the best oyster recruitment, growth, and production. It's fairly low salinity. If it gets over 15, we get predation. Below that, you just don't get a lot of growth or you get competition with some of our mussels. And you can see, for example, in pink, the site that did not do well, Grand Isle, most of the year the salinities were above that ideal zone. While the gray Sister Lake was mostly within those parameters. So even though we've got variability in salinity, as we would expect, how far it varies or what type of anomalies you get outside of the primary zone can have a big impact. So clearly we know that environment affects the individual and the population. So this is where we started getting into how do we get better at identifying where we can you know, at identifying or improving our habitat suitability models. And this is where we started getting into a little working with some modelers. And dynamic energy budget theory is sort of, I'll say it's sort of something that's kind of being pushed out of Europe. We see it more and more in the United States. But Baz Kuchman introduced it, and there's a tome that he's written about it, which is available online. And basically it's this idea, he's trying to develop a theory that fits for all organism, that looks at energy flow through the organism. And the idea is that you can use the same model for a shellfish to a bird to an elephant. You just have to change some of the parameter variables. The idea is that it's based on metabolic theory. We know that temperature affects most of our physiological and metabolic rates. And that food is what provides the energy for us to grow. The basic theory is that the food goes in and the reserve is what maintains the organism as it is today. When there's extra energy, it goes into building structure, and anything left over will go into reproduction. This modeling has been used a lot for the Pacific oyster, Chrysostria gigas, on a lot of the oyster aquaculture that they're doing in France and other places. And we wanted to try to develop one for the eastern oyster. And furthermore, we said, 
we can do one with food and temperature but if we don't include figure out a way to put salinity in there it's really probably not going to work very well and so we hypothesized that yes temperature is important we know it controls oyster physiology and metabolism and we know obviously if they don't have food they can't grow so how much energy they get is important but we also know that salinity can control this and we had two hypotheses number one is that salinity would affect basically the maintenance of the oysters the amount of energy required just to maintain normal function so if you're a bit stressed or salinity is lower or higher than you would like to osmoregulate you need to spend more energy the other hypothesis was that salinity might just affect food ingestion so it may slow down their filtration capability or it may affect their food resources although we haven't gotten into altering salinity and food yet and so what we did was take some individual oysters into the lab and we exposed them to different conditions of salinity and temperature and on the left is the output from measuring um, respiration rates so that would be if respiration rates are affected by salinity then that would indicate that maintenance might be um, very changed based on salinity and what you can see is that while temperature clearly had an impact on respiration rates salinity didn't and that was interesting the other thing we did was look at clearance rate and we measured how quickly they filtered the water and here you see a very different response and that salinity it did indeed change or affect the clearance rate of the oyster and so this is this model and this is a busy slide but basically we took that information and put it into our model and tested it on some field uh, data that we had from a high salinity site Grand Isle and a low salinity site which is a coquetry where the Louisiana Marine Consortium lab is located in um, Louisiana and the main thing to point out um, on the left is the low salinity on the right is the high salinity the black dots are actual field observations and then the different lines represent the different um, approaches to modify the theory so the red line is where we just modified the model by saying salinity affected the amount of energy that went in so the filtration rate the blue lines are various measures on how much salinity uh, might have affected respiration and so what you see is that the red line alone matches most closely the observations in the field and so salinity we were able to modify that model and develop this growth model for the eastern oyster um, based solely on how salinity affects filtration so at this point we're just finishing this up uh, Homé Laveau was the individual that led this work and worked on the model and we're finishing it up but it is essentially a growth model they're starting to look at deb theory in terms of putting into population models but right now it looks at individual growth and so for restoration purposes it was difficult because it didn't account for mortality which is really big so at the same time we also started working with some other modelers to do coupled oyster population hydrodynamic models um, this was with a, a USGS colleague who had built a similar model for Apalachicola Bay and essentially this model incorporated population level effects and modeled growth um, so these are based more on while the DEB model is considered to be more a mechanistic model this is based more on taking the data and fitting some equations to it and we were able to use this model and to tie it into a lot of the restoration and planning for Louisiana because we could show how biomass or oyster production so the growth of the oyster and there's actual production would shift both in location <clears throat> and over time under different conditions this set of graphs just shows some different inputs where we varied in um, Breton Sound estuary so let's see where this is so this is data this is one of the big areas that we work Breton Sound estuary is where <clears throat> Louisiana has one of the largest um, freshwater diversions where they're trying to take the Mississippi River and put the freshwater into the estuary to push the isohalines further south and to also introduce sediment to help restore marshes so there's a lot of a ton of controversy over what that's doing to our fisheries resources and in particular the oysters 
And so we came up with several scenarios that looked at changes in the management of that river flow, sea level scenarios, and then the combination of the two. And so I don't know at this point if these outputs are reflecting reality. The idea is that we're able to take some of our field and lab data and to combine it and help inform and build a model that managers and restoration folks are starting to try to use to better, to improve their habitat suitability indices. The last thing that we're trying to do, and this is our ultimate goal, and we're just starting on this, is to take our mechanistic DEB model and put it within a framework where we can have population and mortality and combine hydrodynamics. And that will be coming over the next year or two. So clearly we know environment affects individuals, populations, and potentially the interactions between populations and the metapopulations. So the big thing we hear about and we see in the news is what about functions and services? That's sort of the part that you see being sold out there. If you're not interested in eating the oysters, you care about the oysters because they do all these other cool things. So a lot of the projects that you see that are actually built right now are for shoreline protection, the idea of living shorelines, habitat restoration, and enhancement of water quality. And so I went back, I'm going to go through these one by one with some of the data we have, but I'm also drawing from some of these have a lot of information that we know about it, and it's trying to look at it in terms of how important is the oyster population or the individual oyster growth in helping to tell us how effective the restoration is in providing these services. So I'll start with habitat. This is probably the most well studied. Tons of research that's out there, not just from shellfish reefs, but this draws from coral reefs and rocky intertidal zones. But basically I think most people agree that oyster reefs in general support high diversity and density of nectin. And some recent work and some older work has been that it may, restored reefs or introducing new reefs may augment or enhance production of commercial and economic, commercial and recreational fisheries. There's also indications that it's not equal everywhere, that location can matter. For example, some of our work where we restored reefs, but it was in an area that was already 30% reef hard bottom habitat, we were unable to see some enhancement. And there's some work out of Dauphin Island that also shows that location is extremely important. And then lastly, this idea of complexity. So some people suggest that because reefs are increasing the complexity, if you've got a mud bottom, it's a mud bottom. Some people would argue with me that it's not that homogeneous, but we might argue that it is compared to what a reef can provide. But it's unclear as to how the density of oysters or the composition or the height of the reef might actually affect the habitat value or the provision of habitat. So a couple studies that we did, a master's student in my lab a number of years ago, looked at some small created reefs where we made what we called low, medium, and high relief. Unfortunately, he really liked doing his graphics. Our reefs weren't actually clustered together. They're a bunch of piles of loose shell, although this looks a lot prettier. But they varied in height from sort of what's typical in Louisiana, which is just a layer of shell on the bottom, about 10 centimeters, to a high relief that might be 30 or 40 centimeters. And on the top in orange, went out and sampled and looked at abundance of fish and invertebrates that had recruited to the reef. The two treatments on the left, so the mud bottom was just an open mud bottom, and the cage was basically the structure we had used to try to hold the reef together, but without any shell in it, to make sure that organisms weren't recruiting to that structure. And then we just had low and high relief. And so clearly, just having the reef there was increasing the abundance of these species. But we didn't see a difference between the low and high relief. And that could be we didn't test enough variation between low and high. You know, the East Coast has shown, and some studies here have shown, that having three-dimensional structure is extremely important. 
in louisiana we don't have a lot of that because we're in extremely shallow water and micro tidal areas so so most of our reefs really are you know a twenty centimeter reef is a really really high reef in our environment the other study that we did and so on the top it shows that they're recruiting there and it's probably providing some type of um, substrate and habitat for them on the bottom was a lab study looking at redfish predation on grass shrimp and we put in again the three different types of relief and looked at foraging success so you can see when we just had an empty tank it's a round tank uh, pretty much everything got eaten they had nowhere to hide um, but when you started adding oyster shell there was a reduction in foraging success and so the reefs were clearly providing refuge for some of these organisms so when you think about it this way obviously the characteristics of the reef and whether you have growth and individual uh, you know density of your oysters will have some type of impact on the provision of refuge and um, habitat for these organisms um, what we're not sure about is exactly how much you need to provide so the other thing that I've done recently and this was a recent master's student um, that I worked with at SUNY uh, Stony Brook was trying to look at using an energetics model and this was using my data from the sister lake the one that always has done really well in terms of oyster recruitment and production and basically um, built an energetics model which was tracking by tracking the flow of carbon through the system um, and it looked at how the growth oyster growth rate on the reef so if you put a reef down there for restoration um, is there we talk about development trajectories of restoration projects how does the actual recruitment of oysters and their growth rates impact the use of the reef or the development and the biomass the transfer of carbon of other communities on the reef and here let me see if I can point these out I don't know if you can see them so and I can't really see it either but the circles are the baseline so this is our observed data and then these scenarios this is where we reduced the growth rate of the oysters that initially settled and this is where we increased the growth rate so this is oyster biomass and the idea with these others um, graphs is showing how that affected the um, biomass of reef resident fish transient fish and um, transient non pacific fish and so obviously where you put the reef you may get oysters no matter what but even just changing their growth rate so you may pick a great area when they pick those habitat uh, those locations based on the HSI and then you get a very low salinity set of two years you get low recruitment you may not see the results that you, you had expected so it's just something to think about and again think about the time period over which you're looking at restoration so um, there's a reason why everyone's got their favorite reef and their GPS for fishing um, but the not only does the environment specifically directly affect um, fisheries in that area but it affects the oysters and the growth of the reef which will affect the fisheries that are there so the other thing that we hear about a lot is water quality and so oyster reefs are thought to improve water quality through filtration they can clear the water column and they'll deposit um, the material either they'll either assimilate it or deposit it through species or pseudo feces um, this is just a graph where he had taken that same data set from sister lake and looked at filtration rates as the oyster population grew so this is kind of a a dummy slide because obviously if you've got higher oyster density and bigger sizes you'll get greater filtration rates that you can attribute to the reef so clearly having the oysters affects this um, contribution the other things that people have looked at more recently is the sequestration um, sort of nutrient mitigation role through sequestration burial and um, <coughs> denitrification <coughs> and we're still working with these data this was a master's student that defended a couple weeks ago um, where he did some uh, closed system incubations following uh, methods of um, Tina Miller way and Robert Twilley and we worked in Robert Twilley's lab and we looked at denitrification fluxes so this is sort of raw data because I wanted to show you how variable it was 
um, not only if you look at the y-axis, you can see the difference in the numbers between the summer and the winter, but our two sites, so in blue is Lake Fortuna. That site was located um, heavily influenced in Breton Sound Estuary. It's heavily influenced by the river, probably, although we don't have all the numbers, super high nitrogen concentrations. And these fluxes that we recorded are higher than anything that's been recorded for oyster reefs but they're actually at the lower end of what um, Victor Rivera Monroy has reported for wetlands and mangrove systems in our area. So we're still kind of looking at this to see if we can make sense of it. And again, you can see we know that temperature has a big impact, um, but there's significantly reduced in the winter. Um, this also, we tried to relate it to oyster density and the, the size of the reef, um, but found absolutely no link there. And part of our reasoning is that it may be that, you know, a lot of denitrification on these reefs, when people take cores, they're taking them adjacent to the reefs um, with the idea that there's sort of a footprint that it extends beyond it. And within our systems, the bottom is just this hodgepodge of oyster shell and mud bottom. We don't have these real discrete reefs that sit on their own. Um, <clears throat> And that's partly why we think our reference sites, which were supposed to be mud bottoms, matched our shallow and our deep water reefs. Um, the other thing that we did was just look at, because there were numbers, there's a lot on the East Coast, who always feel like the long lost cousin on the Gulf Coast, with the exception of um, what Dr. Carmichael had done down here, was looking at nitrogen and carbon within shell and oyster tissue. And essentially what we found in Louisiana, regardless of those site, which site we were at, whether it was high nitrogen or not, we found similar um, percents in nitrogen and carbon as they had found here in Alabama and up along the East Coast. And so I always have mixed feelings about reporting or thinking about them this way, because if you want to look at it as a form of nutrient mitigation, you have to remove the shell and the oyster from the system entirely. And so we kind of did some calculations based on harvest data and what was taken out from that system. And it would indicate that in 2013, there was 10 tons of nitrogen and 375 tons of carbon could have been removed by the system. And a lot of our shell is unfortunately removed from the system because the oyster minutes actually, the oyster shucking house sell a lot of that shell to other areas for road beds. But it's also a reason why we're having problems with oyster, maintaining our oyster reefs, because we know that the reefs are built on their own shell. And so if you're removing it, you're removing the actual physical structure. So I threw it out there, but it's not something I like to focus on or talk about much, because I don't think they should be removing their shell. So the last thing is this idea of living shorelines. Um, this idea has been around for a while. It's, um, and the use of oyster reefs was the first published thing that we found was in 1997 up in North Carolina, where they made some created fringing reefs and found that they did reduce um, shoreline at in some locations, but it was never entirely uh, an all. No, no study, I think, that's up here that have listed or any of the others that have done have actually found this to be true. Um, at all the sites that they test. And so we know that this probably varies um, due to a lot of factors. And this includes um, not just sort of the environment, the variation in the, the environment, but recruitment of oysters and the building of the reef over time. One of the things that when you start working with engineers, so they're always, you know, we can build more structure and we know it'll stop the wave energy. Um, you know, and the argument of us ecologists, and Dr. Severi and I were just talking about it, is that you're supposed to provide the substrate so they can build their own structure. That's where living comes from. But still then, we are still trying to figure out why putting a reef type um, structure in front of a, a, a marsh, an eroding marsh, works in some places and not in others. And all those projects I'd shown you at the beginning that are kind of across the coast, we had developed a pretty large data set of either monthly or quarterly changes in shoreline position that goes along also with oyster recruitment and growth. And we tried, looked at this in terms of what we called exposure. So we, just to kind of confirm on here, 
this is all of the sites that we looked at over time in black you have the reef sites or sort of the shoreline edge in movement where reefs were located and in gray you have the shoreline edge where no reef the reference sites was located you can see they're all still negative this is Louisiana we take the lowest negative we can get and that there was you could say argue some reduction in erosion at a number of the reefs but not at all of them and it wasn't anything really to get excited about and go out and build a bunch of these so we ended up creating for each of our sites an exposure index that's based on wave fetch and the winds during the period wind direction and wind speed during the period of observation and um, for simplicity, we're looking at it in terms of shoreline movement by a low, intermediate, and high exposure. And you can see that the impact of the reef was more visible when you got into higher exposure areas. So that these reefs, you know, by, and, and for us, low exposure is really low energy environments. And so in those areas, if a reef, if a shoreline was eroding, it was probably more due to subsidence and vegetative dieback. Well, in the higher exposure areas, it might have been eroding more to wave energies, which is what the reefs were meant to be helping with. Um, but again, when we get to that, we still need to think about if we care about these living shorelines, we need to make sure that we're putting them in places where the oysters are going to grow. And so we took one of these, um, this is a habitat suitability index that Tom Sonyat, who's at University of New Orleans, works with a lot. Um, we took the habitat suitability index um, and applied it to, again, this is Breton Sound Estuary, the same location uh, I've been talking about for all the modeling. And under average river flow conditions, um, placed the HSI in it with red being areas that are highly suitable for oysters and green being not very suitable for oysters. And then just randomly picked a, lot, a bunch of shorelines and calculated their exposure during different periods of the year. And so, you know, long term, when we go in and try to argue for living shorelines, the argument is that we really need to look at both what the environment is for where the reef could have an impact, but also where the reef is likely to succeed and grow. And so, <clears throat> when we're talking about reefs and restorations, the environment, how it affects the individual and the population, and how it, um, both of those affect function and services are things that you've got to think about when you're setting up any kind of strategic framework. Um, and you also need to think about the scale at which you're going, because there's often a lot of discussion over what are our goals and how far out do we have in order to meet them or to maintain them. And so, um, you know, this means that we have to look at restoration and goals under a lot of different scenarios. So some of the, that's where some of the modeling that I showed you comes in handy because we can kind of predict, they've gotten fairly good at predicting how water quality may change under different restoration, you know, river flow scenarios. Um, we need to tie that back to the organism. And so this is that same graph of average river inflow on the left. And on the right is a proposed high river inflow. And so if you're looking at doing living shorelines using oysters within Breton Sound Estuary, if our restoration plan ends up going ahead with high river inflow, it's not likely that oyster reefs are going to be a good choice. So the other thing sort of on the same line is this is taking our DEB model of the oyster and looking at longer term climate change. So this is again in the same estuary at two different locations and we took um, the green line is sort of the average long-term conditions in terms of salinity and temperature. And then we applied the model taking an increase of temperature of two degrees and a decrease, as well as an increase and decrease of salinity of two and a half and five. And those were to mimic sort of a hot dry year and cold wet years. And so using the DEB model, we could predict how the individual oyster would grow during that time period. So you can see that in what's called, <coughs> sorry, um, you know, in the upper bay where it's going to get so too fresh, you're going to basically have, this is probably mortality, but we can't, we don't have mortality in the model yet. But in the upper bay, salinities are a little bit high. And so the decrease in salinities or the change in salinity, it's still within the range of where the oyster will do well. <coughs> 
but these are tools that where we're trying to take our field and our lab data and help them to inform the management so basically you know sort of the thing that i keep coming back to when i talk to the management agencies involved with these framework development and the nonprofit organizations who do a lot of good things is that you know the oyster itself is what we need to think about because that risk that affects the sustainability of the restoration project provision of services and i'm including harvest and so need to think about the spatial and temporal scale that you're working in and how that's going to affect the oyster and its population over time and space so this is sort of just the take homes understand the oyster i know it's not pretty and cool like the dolphin but it's a pretty neat organism on its own. Um, oyster individual, oyster growth population and metapopulation dynamics are key. Um, some work that's being done more recently is looking at population tolerances, genetics, and adaptation potential. So if temperatures or salinities are increasing, can you know will it, how will the oysters do? Um, you know, understand the relevant scales. What are the changing conditions and trends? Um, do we have increasing anomalies, so more extremes that the oysters or the restoration project needs to deal with? And ultimately, we all want to jump to the service provision, but that is dependent on the oyster and its environment. So you always need to think about the base that you have. And that is all I have, um, other than thanking this work was done through a number of funding sources. So I'll take any questions if you have them. So the bonnet carry spillway is into Lake Pontchartrain, which affects Mississippi Sound. Um, so I haven't actually worked there. Where I've been working is Carnarvon Diversion. And I apologize, I should have put up a map of Louisiana um, to show everybody. Um, so I think that the state, the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, has looked at their, um, they've got a pretty extensive monitoring program. And so I think that they have some numbers. Um, for where Bonnet Carey did it impact the oysters, but I'm not, I'd have to look, pull it up for you. Correct. That's, so that's a, a great question because you have to, I mean, overall, we would say average is great, but if your first year of not meeting it, um, you know, depending on where you start, so you may already start with a net, um, you know, positive in your basket. And so you may have up to 20 or, you know, 20 grams that you could lose before you're getting buried by sediment. So, you know, it's like a lot of the marsh restoration, they're trying to figure out what elevation to put it back up at because they know subsidence will occur. Um, so I think that might come into partly the planning. So how big do you build your reef to start with and how much buffer do you give knowing the variability for that location or for that system? Does that make sense? <laughs> 
Can we what? I think if you've done that, you've done everything right. Can you do that? Or can I create a check without you guys have to have? Well, I mean, if you get a good reef that's building, so you've got, you know, you get the right location, you've got oyster recruitment, you've got great growth, you've got production, it will support, theoretically, if we go with what we know, means that you'll likely have a more complex reef so over time, so you're providing habitat for fisheries. And then um, water quality and sequestration is related to what the oysters are that are on the reef. I mean, they're all interrelated. The only thing would be this living shoreline, shoreline protection is very location specific. And so whether the ideal location and shape of the reef for living shoreline is also really complementary to the habitat um, is a question that you could probably look at. But I think it's possible. I just don't know that we, I could do it today. 